very good evening to each and every one of you and welcome back to you, Mr. Brendan McCaffrey. Thank you. From me with Belinda Scandal, how the heck are you? I know, right, we've been away, we? We've, we've had holidays. You know, holidays. Imagine that. We'll never get that again for the next year. I know, what happened with no, that? No, Not no. the same time. So where did you go? I went to Benidorm. You went to Benidorm. I went to yeah. Gran Canaria, all the... Um, Salubrious places, yes. <laughs> we were there. We, we, we embraced ourselves in the culture. We were living the dream. We were. We were living we were. that dream. That dream and was being lived. In Manchester. And now we're back here in Manchester with a fantastic show lined up for you today, everybody. Yes, indeed. On the show today, we are going to be talking to the creator and BAFTA award winning lady herself, Sophie Willen. She's going to be talking to us in just a few minutes' time. Also, also we'll be talking to Henry Lewis, he's here from the Mischief Company. He is the player that goes wrong, a bit like our show. Yeah. Yes. Your Manchester goes wrong yes. just as every week. It probably won't do. It probably will do this week. Yeah, because it went far too well last week, <laughs> didn't it? Uh, well done to our. the problem? Which, maybe, maybe we've maybe. got too much energy running through us. That's clearly what it That's is. That's what it That's is. Too much energy. energy. Also on the show today and on our sofa joining us is our lovely guest talking about Genopolis. We've got Charlie Husson Sykes, everybody. There we go. And uh, we're going to be delving into a, a heart condition story very, very soon as well, as we talk to Jack Cameron Dickinson. So that's all to come on today's show. But first of all, as we did say, we are talking, first of all, to BAFTA award winning. Yes, oh, I, think, yes. I think there's more than one in the pipeline here. You know, oh. I really do. I tell you, this is America. She's building a little gold statuette by now. <laughs> Alma's Not Normal. If you don't know what Alma's Not Normal is all about, let's have a look at this. I've got to be honest, I've got no job experience, but I've got pizzazz, I've got charisma, and I think outside the box. Once you commit to a turban, your whole personality changes. I feel it. I saw your sign outside. I want to be an actress. Big mistake. We're not doing a pan tour this year. Have you got anything without bits? I don't eat egg anymore, Alma. Who wants to eat the unborn child of a depressed hen? If you want to dump me, Alma, just do it in a normal way. I'm not normal, though, am I? Alma's not normal. Press red to watch now. Press red to watch that. now. Alma is not no. Some of the lines in. Let's bring I, Sophie in. Welcome to the welcome show, Sophie. Hello. How are I? I mean, it's it's funny to watch, but it's even funnier to think of that you've actually put them words into an actors' mouths because this is literally your child, isn't it? It was born to you. You created it. Where did it come from? The inspiration. Well, it was kind of semi autobiographical. And uh, well, I wrote the first script in 2014, and I, I wrote it with. Well, I had a producer commission it in Manchester. Then it went to London, disappeared, died a death. So then I started doing stand up, trying a lot of that material in stand up, and then it had another life when I won the Carolina Home Bursary, and then got to redo it. And then we put it on a, a live performance of it in London. Got the commissioners, the BBC Two channel controller, to come and watch it to see if they'd commission it, and then it just kind of went from there, really. It's been a long time in the pipeline. 2014 was the first script commission. Wow. So it's kind of a... It's, it's, yeah. a, bit of a, it's a bit of a, a, a crazy show because obviously it's quite... You know, you say it's, it's autobiographical, but the words that you use is so typical normal it, it's called almost not normal but it's normal speech yeah. it's stuff that we recognize do you think especially that, up here yeah oh yeah. yeah do you think people watch the show because they connect to it the, the characters on screen i hope so yeah and i do think there's an irony to say not normal because actually it is like you said really normal family dynamics you know there's always a lot going on in in most people's families and i think that kind of plays out in alma with humor and some darker bits as well, which I think, again, you know, it's always a mixed bag, isn't it? You know, there's kind of moments, I don't know about with your family, but with my family, where it's kind of insanity and then hilarious at the same time. <laughs> oh, you know, oh yes. Yeah. So know. you say, you say semi-autobiographical. Um, what have you drawn from then that you put into this? I suppose a similar background, Alma, you know, was brought up in, in, in and out of the curse system. She was temporarily fostered by a, a grandmother, I got my records back from social services when I was 23. Obviously, Alma gets them at 30, so there's diff slight differences. But that experience of getting your social service records, you know, I wanted to show that, how, how I personally experienced it. Obviously, it's different for everybody. But I don't think you've really seen that in a comedy before. I mean, it's always very bleak when you hear about care experience people. Yeah. When they get I mean, the last person I've seen get the records back on screen was the Joker, and then he went on a killing spree. So, <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. It's yeah, almost like, it was like um, 
Yeah. It, it, it reminds me a bit of like an adult Tracy Beaker almost. You know, you an get, adult you Tracy Beaker. Aspect. No, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. got, it's got that care aspect because it was one of those shows that showed you what care life can be like. Yeah. yeah. So do you think the way you've written this show, it's showing people an insight into what care can be for people who've grown through it? I think all you can do as well is, is kind of say what feels real to you and what was true to you because I suppose every person who's been through care experience has so different experiences of it. But there might be certain universalities and there'll be other things people go, that wasn't how it was for me. It was more like this. So I think really just opening up that conversation and just, you know, explaining how it was for you at the time, which is what I wanted to do with, with that, you know, with, with Alma, is sometimes that you get these records and they're really overwhelming and the sense of hopelessness and, and the sense of feeling, God, is this, you know, reading about yourself in a clinical format is, is very intense but then also wanting to show the optimism that it doesn't have to be the end you know and showing that actually you're still a human being outside of what's been written about you on, on record I suppose and of course we've got the character in there of Alma but I mean the characters that surround her in this I mean yeah. it's easy to write them off as stereotypical comedy characters but it's more than that once you get past and into it because they've all got a tragedy about them I mean how do you go about sculpting such good characters oh god that's a Good question, isn't it? I don't know. Thank you. I, I suppose <laughs> just the, the, the women like I've known them, and I suppose a lot of, of people will know them, you know, that they kind of had ideas above the station. You know, there's like trauma and, and class issues and mental health and loads of things that have got in the way. But ultimately, they're very loving people and they've all got a good sense of humour. And they're all eccentric. They never quite fitted in. I mean, my grandma was very much like Grandma Joan you know, that she got divorced, she wore a lot of animal prints. I mean, when it was her funeral, we all wore different animal prints. And when we were taking out the coffin, we played Right Said Fred, I'm Too Sexy, as the coffin went out. You know, so <laughs> there's a lot of, like, you know, kind of full people. They were just, you know, my grandma was just, like, otherworldly and wanted to be fully embracing life, which meant she felt everything very fuller, whether it was a good emotion or a, or a bad emotion. I, I, you know, as does the, the character Lynn. You know, and I wanted to show that relationship between addiction and trauma and the relationships of the family system and how that kind of plays out, really. But specifically with women, you know, the yeah. group of women and how that kind of... I really enjoy all the little digs that they make at each other, you know, that no one can... No, there's no healthy situation. Everybody's fighting to be in the role of victim. That relates back to what you were saying, though. It's very real. Yeah. It's very visceral and very real. Yeah. Well, the... I've got really into a book called The Drama Triangle and it's all about the, the family dynamics or, or dynamics that play out in the world, the victim, the rescuer and the hero. And oh, now yeah. when there's a, a trauma in a family or globally or whatever, people try and slot into these social situations where people are fighting for victims, some person's going in as rescuer. So when I was writing the dialogue of those scenes, I was thinking, well, who's fighting for victim now and who's in rescue and who's, you know, and, and looking at the psychology of them as it plays out. Um, so where are we at at the moment then with the BAFTA winning situation? Is it one, two, twelve thousand? How many have you won so oh, far, Sophie? I, I spread that rumor. I like that twelve thousand. <laughs> it's two now. I'm really chuffed. The one for writer, and one for actor. So that was a fabulous moment. I wasn't expecting the actor one at all. Well, I wasn't expecting the writer one. That was like, yeah. <laughs> I know, but I wasn't expecting the actor the writer. Well, that was a shoe in. <laughs> But the actor one, I mean, it really blew my socks off when that we happened. We saw the video of it, didn't we? You running around where you were living at the time, running around very excited. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the latest one, because it's quite a big, the Royal Festival Hall or whatever, it's a massive building. And I jumped up and then I started effing and blinding. The BBC had to cut it all down. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be dead elegant today. I'm going to really show that I can be an elegant Boltonian and it did not go well. <laughs> So when are we due for um, series two then? Well, I'm cracking on now. I'm getting, yeah. you know, I've had a few months now. Of, it's all been quite a whirlwind, you know, woo, party central. Yeah, yeah. You know, celebrating and all that and, and just trying to get a bit centred now and actually get writing, which is what I've been doing this week. And I suppose so, to really push it, where, where do we expect them to go, these characters? Well... Is there anything you can tell us? I, I, I'd like Alma to explore the story of meeting her dad. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's quite surreal, you know, using some of my own experiences as well. So there'll be quite a surreal journey there that she goes on with her grandma. I've got an idea for a scene that I really want to do with uh, grandma and uh, Alma go to uh, 
this is exclusive, by the way. I've not told anyone this. So oh, oh, good. Oh, love it. Um, they go to Wilmslow because uh, I, I, this is from personal. I remember my grandma when I was about 16, she said, look, I've heard that Wilmslow is the Hollywood of the North. Everybody's there. We must go to Wilmslow. And we got on a train and we went to Wilmslow and it was so depressing. And we sat <laughs> in the slug and lasses with a lime and soda and grandma was so depressed. She had this little faux fur hat on and some mittens. She'd really made an effort. And she got there and she just went, it's not Hollywood, is it? And I thought there's something so, it summed up so much. And then she got chatted up on the way back um, at the train station. So she was really happy after that. But I thought there's something about, again about the tragic comedy of this idea of, of what you dream of and then the reality. So there'll be some stuff around that. I'm really desperate to get Leanne on a canal boat doing uh, <laughs> I had an idea that she'd win a canal boat in a in a gambling uh, incident and, and then she's her own cabaret cafe. So we'll see where that goes. Well, and that then sounds Lynn... fantastic. It really does. <laughs> It sounds amazing. But uh, unfortunately, Sophie, we are going to have to wrap this up now because we've yes. got to go and look where the Queen's going to be lighting her first beacon, unfortunately. Mm. Yes. Oh, really? oh, so God, from one Queen good. to another. Sophie, oh. thank you so much for thank your time, you very my much, Sophie. And uh, so can't much. wait for season two. Thank you very we're much. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Right then, so, so we did say we're looking at beacons. I can't wait for that. Oh, do you know what? No, I, I love it. Do you know the way she was like, she did the, she did the yeah. circle? Yeah. I actually was going to apply for that. Would you? Well, I was. And then we did lockdown and I thought sitting in a room and me only talking to three people. Social, Would have been social just social like media lockdown. wasn't the change. Yeah, so, so exactly. It's no problem. All right, then. Let's, uh, Matt Llewellyn's going to be doing us a few pieces. He's going to be going to a few of the royal um, places that are within our lovely, lovely region. This is just one of them. Let's see where he is this week. Hello, and here I am on the first of my Jubilee journeys around Greater Manchester, visiting places associated with the Queen or the upcoming Platinum Jubilee. And just over there is Hartshead Pike, this monument that sits in the borough of Tameside, halfway between Ashton Underline and Oldham over there. And the pike has played a major part in royal history. That's not the first pike to have sat here. The first one was built to commemorate the visit to the local area by King Canute, the one who tried to hold back the tides and stop the sea coming in, as I seem to remember. This one dates back to the 1860s and was built for the marriage of the Prince of Wales to Queen Alexandra of Denmark. And there's been beacons lit here, flaming torches to show that news is to be spread around the country, and that's happened down the years. And that is what is happening for the Platinum Jubilee. So all across the country on the 2nd of June, and they'll be lit from 9.45 in the evening, over 2,000 beacons will be lit around the UK and over 54 in Commonwealth countries. And the one here is to be the first one. Won't be a gas jet here, but it will be a light show. And that will start it off. All the beacons will be lit around the world, culminating in the one at Buckingham Palace. Now, I'm going to put the bunting up. I'm hoping to bump into somebody royal. You would think you would, wouldn't you? So have a look to see where the beacons are taking place in your area. And I'll see you next week on your Manchester with another Jubilee Journey. Do you know what the fact we can get Prince Charles in this show? Uh, just do you know what I mean? Eh? We are... Headliner after headliner. <laughs> and uh, one gentleman that's going to be headlining very, very soon over in the theatres is the originator and creator of the play that goes wrong. Now, you're yes. going to see this, are you? Oh, I'm dying to see it too. Tennyson yeah. player. Oh, I can't wait. Do you know what else is coming? Oh, he's... Do you know what else project? is coming? Let's just run that little BT about uh, a certain radio station. Coming soon, Chatterbox Radio, part of the Your Manchester Media family, broadcasting live every day. It's where the city comes to talk. That's right, everybody, yes. coming your way very, very soon to the airwaves, audio, so you don't have to stare at. Well, you do this. have a face for radio. Thank you, I do. Like, you've got hands for modelling. I like it, honestly. <laughs> I've been a hand model. You could be a hand model. I've been a hand model. Been a hand model. From Manchester City. Sterling. Anyway, everybody, see, it's getting that way now. It's almost <laughs> like you're ready for the tenuous little link here. It's almost like the play that goes wrong. <laughs> I mean, 
mean, could it get any more exciting, Brandon? I know. The original cast returning for literally two weeks within this year, bringing us the play that goes wrong. And my favourite, everybody, is Mr. Henry Lewis. And he joins us right here now. Henry Lewis, welcome to the show. How are you? Hello. I'm very well. I'm very well. Thanks for having me. I suddenly realised then, as I did that impression, that that might have been your real voice. You just never know, do you? <laughs> I, I mean, where did this character of yours develop from? I mean, I've met a few within drama schools and drama, things like that, but where did it come from for you? Well, I mean, yeah, no, I, I certainly uh, grew up in amateur theatre and, um, you know, there's definitely lots and lots of uh, actors in that environment who like the sound of their own voice. So I'm sure there's uh, been a few inspirations. But the inspiration for the whole show kind of came from... Um, a guy called Michael Green, who wrote a book called The Art of Course Acting, very funny book, um, about 50 years ago now. Um, and he wrote short plays, course acting plays, uh, in which things sort of started to unravel for the actors. And so that was a big, uh, that was a big inspiration for us in terms of the style of comedy. Um, right, not the characters necessarily, but the style, yeah. It's uh, all very, very ingenious stuff yeah. because you've not just brought a, a sort of new genre to us, you, you've brought us something that is, it's quite old school, but it's actually done so remarkably well. Thanks to you guys. Why is um, why would you say this type of comedy has come back in full force? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that you know, it's 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 fairly universal kind of the humour. I think that um, obviously physical comedy and stuff. I think um, is uh, something you know that everybody can laugh at. I think that it's not uh, a cynical show. Um, you know, I think it uh, even though I suppose you are kind of. Uh, laughing at other people's pain at sometimes uh, it doesn't feel I don't think uh, sort of cruel it's quite sort of a warm-hearted show um, and, and just a kind of a big funny silly show with you know we, we, we've really tried to always try we were right to get to sort of pack as many jokes as we possibly could into the show uh, so that it really is laugh out loud funny from beginning to end um, and so hopefully I think those are some of the, the factors that, uh, that mean it's, uh, it's, it's done, it's done, it's done okay. Now, Mr. You've obviously done quite a few shows. You've, you've got quite a few goes wrong shows on there at the moment. What exactly is the creative process behind getting these shows going? Because it must be so intricate that you have to put together something that not only looks like it's gone wrong, but it's gone wrong on purpose. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it has to be really, really carefully choreographed. Um, partly because that's what the timing requires in order to make it funny, but also partly because um, you, also for safety reasons, obviously, if you're doing big kind of stunts and that sort of thing, uh, you've got to make sure that everyone's sort of standing in the right place, doing the right things, so that no one actually gets hurt. Um, obviously, of course, you're you're trying to make the slapstick look real and make things look quite painful and make, if someone's being hit with something, you really want them to feel like they have been hit with it uh, so that you really, you really kind of buy into that. But obviously, it's got to be safe and it's got to be something that you can replicate a nights a week you know on a on a yeah. long run um that's really important that it's well choreographed absolutely so yeah we, we work in a lot of detail in the script and we uh try to always make sure um uh what we write is is, is sort of doable and practical in the first instance we don't always succeed there but then we try things out uh with um our company of actors and um, we do lots of workshopping and through that we kind of refine things and we um we take out things that don't quite work and we we, we change stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it's a long process to create a show. So it's called The Play That Goes Wrong. Has it ever really gone wrong? <laughs> it has, yes, of course. I mean, um, you know, it's been going in the West End for seven years, so there's definitely been uh, performances where things haven't quite gone right. Um, there's a moment in the show, I don't want to give too much away for anyone who hasn't seen it, but I'll be seeing it soon in Manchester, but um, it's um, uh, there's a moment in the show where some of the set collapses. We've had a little bit of trouble with some of the, the technical workings of that. The last couple of performances in London, actually, and weirdly we had this similar issue um, in New York where it's, where it's playing off Broadway. Um, so it's, it, yeah, we, we definitely do have problems. We, we had um, a show where Dave Hearn, one of the cast, uh, dislocated his shoulder midway through the the show. Um, that was tricky. That was very painful uh, for him. Uh, but also, of course, the, the audience did think it was part of it, which was slightly tricky. I remember Dave going out in the interval. He got through to the end. It was towards the end of the first act. He got to the interval and then went outside, got in a cab to go to the hospital. Um, and all the audience who were outside, you know, having a drink or whatever uh, in the interval, they all thought that was part of the show. Him getting in the cab and driving off was all part of sort of an immersive part of the show. 
Uh, so everyone was kind of laughing, and you know that was uh, that was <laughs> yeah, the line between reality and fiction. It's, it's a bit Tommy Cooper esque thing, with yes. it. Like, is this part of the gig? Oh no, no, this has actually happened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're coming back to Manchester then, and you're doing Ooh. somewhere else that we don't need to mention. But I mean, why are you coming back now? Why is the original cash returning now? Um, well, I mean, we've we've not done the show for a long time. Um, in fact, it, this year is ten years since we first did the show. Uh, in its initial form as a one-act show um, uh, at the Old Red Lion Theatre in Islington. So it sort of felt like we, we haven't performed the show, um, or we haven't performed Play Goes Wrong together since we did it on Broadway in 2017. So it's been five years since then. So it felt like a good time to get back together and do it one last time. Um, and um, yeah, so, so, so we, we sort of thought we'd, we'd do a couple of weeks of the tour and um, and uh, and and get get back on the horse. See if we can see if we can still do it. So you say one last time. Does this mean this will be the last time you do it, or is this just like just one more go at it? Maybe you'll return. Well, to I it. mean, who knows? I can't predict the future. But for now, it's the la it's the last time we plan to do this particular show uh, as a company. But of course, the tour goes on uh, after we do our two weeks. We do Manchester, uh, and then we do Newcastle, and then uh, then there's the the the, the tour cast who are fantastic. Uh, pick it back up, uh, do Cardiff, and then they're, they're touring right the way through until uh, the end of the summer. So, obviously, like you said, this is a show that's been going on so long. Mm. Can we expect to see a, any possible revamp of the show now that you're doing it with the original cast? But have you guys changed things that you're looking forward to doing differently? No, not not. not uh, there's no no huge plan. But um, we go into rehearsals on Monday, and um, we are <laughs> things might. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it'll be interesting to kind of see what everyone kind of remembers and if there are subtle differences between how the show is running now. It's just got a brand new, brilliant brand new cast in the West End. Uh, so it was sort of, we all went to go and watch their sort of opening night a couple of weeks ago. So it'd be interesting to see if there's anything that we remember slightly differently. Um, but of course, of course, everyone has their own take on the characters. So the show is never exactly the same when the cast changes. Um, so I think we'll be doing, uh, we'll be doing uh, probably as much as we remember of our version, any subtle changes that there are, uh, which might be slightly different from it, how it is uh, currently. I mean, this is an award-winning show. What, what do you think its secret of the success is? Um, I think it's sort of got a, a really sort of warm heart. I think we, we sort of made it, um, it you know, we, we put it together in a really collaborative way. You know, we had all, the, all of the cast who were involved were, uh, were, were sort of part of the development of the show. Um, and we, we did that first run at the Old Red Line. We then went back, did another run there. We did um, a, a run at Trafalgar Studios. That was all when it was a one act show. Then we wrote a second act and then we uh, sort of added that in. Uh, and then when it went on tour, we did six months of touring, 2014, took it into the West End and then did a kind of year or nearly a year as the original cast of the West End. So it had a long, long time of kind of us working it in and really working out every kind of twist and turn of the show and how every single beat of the comedy worked. Um, so I think just apart, apart from anything else, I think just, you know, the amount of time that we spent on it, really, really refining it, I think was a, you know, was a big part of, um, of, of what's made it really, really clean. We've trimmed any fat off of it. You know, it really, um, it really is kind of lean and everything in there kind of, um, uh, you know, we had time in between each of those runs. You know, there was an opportunity to kind of go away and uh, uh, tweak the script, and you know, we did that every time, and we're always refining. So I think that's definitely a, an important thing. It's it's fantastic, and mm -hmm. we can't wait to see it here in Manchester. Yes. But just before you go, if we might push you so hard as to say uh, you're watching your Manchester in your character's voice, please, por favor. Hello, this is Robert Grove saying you're watching your Manchester. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Henry. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Take care. Hi, your Manchester Culture Queen here. And with the fantastic team from Creative Manchester. Creative Society Manchester. Creative Society Manchester. Because we're here today to do some painting um, of Frankenstein. Frankenstein's the theme. We've had a bit of a tour. We've sat down and you'll see a clip of people painting and socialising. Some drinking wine. That'll be me. Um, but I want to introduce you to the woman behind it all. Introduce yourself. Hi, Come. I'm Samaya and I am the founder and creative director at the Creative Society. Okay, she doesn't, she doesn't only look like she's had an operation done on her. <laughs> um, I think you look fabulous actually. Thank you very much. So what, what brought, brought this idea to you? 
So we do lots of regular art classes around the city of Manchester anyway. Um, and we do kind of things like arts and crafts. And the, the point of our business is just to have like a really easy access for people to come and enjoy art. So sometimes it could be seen as kind of a highbrow thing um, where it might not be accessible. So we just really like to make it really relaxed, really chill, really welcoming and really fun. Um, and as a member of the Portico Library, I decided to make a series of literary themed events and this is the first one. I just think it's really, really good. I'll be, I'll She's be, brilliant. I'll be back. The picture's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll send that check later. Anyway, come to the Portico Library if you don't know where it is. It's basically on Portland Street, near Manchester Art Gallery, and also on the way to Primark, <laughs> if you want to go shopping. <laughs> but it's a, a fantastic Georgian building. The other part of it is Bank the Bar, so you can actually do your literary stuff, get some, get some knowledge in the old noggin, be all cultured, and then go down for a nice glass of wine. But today I'm lucky because they've got a bar open. <laughs> anyway, this is Culture Queen for your Manchester. I'm Hayley and welcome to this week's On The Box. Now before I talk about what I'm watching, how exciting is it that we have a new Doctor that was announced last week, Shooty. I cannot wait for that series to start. One of the things I'm really excited to watch is, of course, Conversations With Friends. Now that is available every week, I think it's every Sunday, on BBC Three, but you can catch the whole lot on iPlayer. That is by the same writer as Normal People. That was an epic drama that was out about a year or so ago. I think it was actually May 2020, so it's probably long, it was about two years ago now. It's all this pandemic, it's getting me confused with dates. On the flip side of that, the other thing I want to watch soon is available on all four, and it is Will Young's um, losing my twin and it's all about how he coped with his twin's alcoholism and his twin sadly passed away in about two years ago but I, I, I think it's going to be one of those triggering episodes, triggering documentaries and it's probably going to be something that I'm going to have to watch in little bits but I do want to watch it, I think it's absolutely important. Uh, the other thing I'm watching at the moment is a series called Screw. It's a British comedy drama and it is available on all four. So it's not necessary to um, pay for telly on Netflix and Sky and all of that. There's so much you can see on BBC, um, Channel 4, ITV, etc. There's loads of box sets on Channel 4 and like I said, I've just started Screw. It's absolutely amazing. There's lots of Northern actors in it as well, so you'll probably recognise them. And it's all about the um, prison officers and also the prisoners as well and all the dramas and lives intertwining, etc. And it's absolutely fabulous. Now that's it from me. I shall catch you next time. And remember, stronger together. Bye. Now, not all the stories we cover here on Manchester are always positive ones, although we do try and look for the positive spin in them. And one gentleman's joining us now to tell us his very personal story. Welcome to the studio, Jack Cameron Dickinson. How are you? Hello. Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. No now, problem. To the outside world. You look very healthy, young, fresh. Yes. Uh, to you, though, you're not feeling too healthy. No, not too great. No, not too great. Um, I was recently diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, which is a structural heart disease that basically affects how my heart functions. Mm -hmm. um, it was caught two, four years ago. Um, and then after yearly observations, they finally dropped the bombshell on me in March um, after watching it progress. Um, I feel healthy. It was a massive shock. Like, yeah. um, was not expecting it at all. I went to my appointment thinking I was meeting just a new consultant, thought he wasn't going to tell me anything I didn't already know. And I went on my own because of that. Mm -hmm. And then next thing, we do some tests and he sits me down. He's like, right, so this is what we've witnessed over the last four years. This is what we... And what had they have. witnessed over the last four years? So um, there's something called an ejection fraction, which is the percentage of blood to your chamber of your heart pumps out. Mm -hmm. um, it's normally between 55 and 75. When I first presented four years ago, it was 55. So the lower end normal. Um, in March, it was 46. Nice. So a 10% drop and that is quite significant. Um, so at this point, that's when they thought they'd start to intervene, put me on medication. Do you, do you wonder if they, if they could have caught it earlier, that it could have been helped a lot earlier? No. Um, on my letter that my consultant wrote to me, he said that it was intrinsic. Um, which means it was naturally occurring. Right. Um, it can be caused due to like viruses. Um, the vaccine 
potentially. Um, it's been mentioned. Um, various things. Um, but no, it looks like it's intrinsic. Yeah. Um, potentially genetic. So what does it case. mean for you then? Then what, what does it mean for, for your life going forward? Um, I think it's a long road. Um, medication to start with to manage it. Um, the ones that I'm on, they're called ACE inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, so basically protect my heart and lower my blood pressure. Um, they have their own side effects. Um, but for now, that is the way forwards. He said that I'd either keep it the same or improve it a little bit, or there'll be no change. It'll just keep going down. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, other options are available. Go towards the surgery path. Um, and the end result, really, um, in severe cases, is heart transplantation. Uh, heart transplant mm -hmm. plantation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is the end dilated cardiomyopathy is actually the leading cause for um, transplants in the UK. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's a weird prospect to think about, um, especially when I am so young at 22, feeling so healthy. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a scary thought, but I can only do what I can in the meantime to kind of... Absolutely. I mean, that. obviously talking about it, we're, we're raising awareness of such a thing. What are the symptoms that people should look out for in themselves possibly then? Well, the main symptoms are there. They're quite generic, really. Um, it's breathlessness, um, lightheadedness, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. palpitations, um, and eventually kind of swelling. So when your body kind of collects fluids so in your ankles, your abdomen, stuff like that. Um, but for me personally, I didn't really notice anything because like I said, I go to the gym, I feel quite fit. Um, over the last few years, I haven't felt as fit, um, which I thought was quite odd. Um, but I just thought it was me. You know, this is normal for me. Yeah. And it's only since being on medication and going back to the gym, realizing how unfit I was. Um, for example, a year ago, I could probably hardly run a kilometer. Whereas I went to the gym two months ago, just after I found out, mm -hmm. and I ran 2K off the bat. Um, and then recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I ran 10K, which I never thought oh. would be possible. I was aiming for 5K on that occasion. Mm -hmm. And I got to it, I was like, I'm still label. Like, let's keep going. I, I made this. it to 10K. So has it stopped you doing anything then? <laughs> Going out partying mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. yeah. And at 22, that's not what you want. No. <laughs> not really, but I feel like I've had my time doing that. So Fair. I'm not too gutted. Um, I have to be careful with thrill seeking adventures. So no skydiving, no theme parks. Not to say I would do that anyway. No. no. But it's nice to have the option. Yeah. But it's yeah. okay. I'm, I can live with it. Now, we saw a picture of you over on the, the, the Facebook. The face, with with the this, face of the book. It looks like you were trying to audition for Iron Man. But, what, I mean, what was oh, this I thing that you had in the middle of your chest? It was a um, five-day hold to monitor. So it was like an ECG um, that you wear for five days. And that's just to pick up any abnormal rhythms mm -hmm. or anything to do with the electrical system of my heart. So I have been having, like, palpitations and um, some lightheadedness. So my doctor just wanted to be sure that there's nothing irregular going on. Um, which would need additional treatment. So, for example, a pacemaker, um, if my heart's beating irregularly. Um, so it's a case of waiting to find out at this point because it's all very new. I'm still processing it, yeah. of course. Um, it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah. And it's a journey, I suppose, for your entire family as well, isn't it? It is. It is. Because of my case, it's not down to anything specific. So they think it's genetic, which obviously puts my family into yeah. question. Um, there's nothing in my family history for anything like this, so we're hoping it's fine. Um, but I'll get the results for that, and we'll take it from there. But, Absolutely. Yeah. So, what's the next thing for you then? Is this you're just going to live life to the full? I guess in a way. Definitely, it's definitely given me a lot more motivation to be healthier, quit smoking, kind of just look after myself a little bit more. Not saying that I was unhealthy before. No. But I'm a lot more mindful of it now. Um, especially knowing this information. So I'm just trying to keep myself as healthy as I can and go from there. And I suppose Fantastic. for our viewers that are watching, is there any signs that they could be looking out for if they're thinking perhaps this relates to them? Well, like I said, the main symptoms are quite generic. So it is breathlessness, lightheadedness, palpitations. Um, but I think the thing for me looking back is the kind of feeling unfit for mm -hmm. no reason. Um, I think that's what's registered with me and i'm like wow like that is why i felt so weird all these years and not quite as able as my peers yeah um like I'm, i am quite healthy but physically not as healthy as i look yeah which is deceiving um mm. 
So I guess it's like an invisible disability. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, Which, obviously, because most people associate things like pacemakers with like a, an older generation, yeah. especially to have to think about that so young almost, it, it can happen at any age. So it's making people more aware of that, that is, it is all possible. Of course. Like, I worked in care for 18 months during the pandemic. Mm. Um, and I had patients with pacemakers and all sorts. And it is something you expect to see in an, an older population. Um, I never dreamt that I'd be diagnosed with something like this. Um, I've got a defective valve anyway, which they picked up four years ago. Yeah. Um, they told me that at the time, but all this cardiomyopathy stuff came after, mm -hmm. um, hand in hand with. So, yeah, it's, it can happen to people and it's probably more common than people think. Mm. So it's important to know the signs and look out for it. And how are you feeling knowing that you've got this, this thing going on inside you? Honestly, when I found out, I burst into tears. Like, I cried my mum. I called my mum and cried. And it was just a shock. And it took me yeah. so long to process it. I say so long. It's been two or three months. And I processed it pretty well. But it's still pretty raw. Like, this isn't going to go away. This is for the rest of my life. Um, but knowledge is power. Yeah. And through that, I can live life to the fullest and do what I can and enjoy it with whatever time I have. Yeah. And there's lots of organisations out there as well, isn't there? Of course there is. There's the British House. Heart Foundation, they're amazing. There's so much good information on their website. Um, there's also Cardiomap the UK, all sorts. There is a lot out there. Okay, then. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you for bringing this yes, story to us because it's always very, very important. Uh, and thank you for coming in today. Uh, in the meantime, uh, no thrill seeking on the next part of our program, but let's see what's going on in Manchester. Hello, Michael here with everything you need to know that's kicking off in Manchester in the next week. First, to the Sher Show, which opened at the Palace last night and is here until Saturday. Get ready to turn back time with iconic hits from the equally as iconic songstress. You better believe that this isn't one to be missed. Tickets can be found on the ATG website. This week is also Pride Week in Trafford. With live cabaret, comedy, music and dance acts, there's bound to be fun for all of the family. Some events are ticketed and more information, including the full programme, can be found on the Visit Manchester website. Lastly, and keeping on the same theme, the RuPaul's Drag Race Work the World Tour is landing at the Manchester Arena tomorrow evening. Featuring some of your favourite queens from the UK series, this isn't one to be missed. Whatever you're doing this week, be sure to let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at your MCR, and I'll see you again soon. Hello, my lovely weather watchers, and welcome to this week's weather forecast with me, Paul Rudd. And I'm here in Oldham Town Centre this week, and that just behind me is Oldham Parish Church, which dates back in the 1830s. One of the famous men that was buried here was Joseph Scholes and he died in 1814. Now he was known as the Oldham Giant but he wasn't just tall, he weighed over 38 stone. He was the governor of the workhouse and the town crier. <laughs> Well, it's not looking that bad for Manchester this week. It's looking rather good, actually. Let's take a look at this week's weather in more details. Thursday is looking sunny and cloudy with the temperatures of 25 degrees Celsius. Friday is also looking sunny and cloudy with the temperatures of 21 degrees Celsius. And let's take a look into the weekend's weather right now. Saturday is looking sunny and cloudy with a temperature of 14 degrees Celsius and Sunday is looking all right as well. Sunny and cloudy with the temperatures of 25 degrees Celsius. Now we may have the odd shower coming in as well so just be careful about that but it is looking fine and dry for the rest of the week and weekend. So for me Paul Rudd here in Oldham Town Centre outside Oldham Paris Church. It's time to go back to the studio for this week's brilliant episode of, are you ready? Your Manchester!
it's going to be it's well, well, yeah. 20, what. Well, what'd you say? 25, 25 degrees? degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's got my shorts on, bro. I know, you've got your legs out. Everything. I know, right? That's what people watch this show, right, my legs? Yeah, for your legs, definitely. We're <laughs> <laughs> just going to close up on the night. <laughs> Like what can I say? You know, You've been working on your film, haven't you? I have, yes. Secrets of a Wallaby Boy. Secrets of a Wallaby Boy. How's yes. it gone? Very well. I was working with Mark Benson on Wednesday. Yeah. playing my dad. I um, want to know what the robot does in this. I, well, there, there are things that are going to happen, and I think it's going to be a film for the ages. If you like a carry on film, if you like Confessions of a Window Cleaner, put it together with an LGBT theme, and you've got Secrets of a Wallaby Boy. It's making me want a gin, and one lady that knows how to talk about gin is showing us right now. Charlie, Houston Sykes, how are you? Hello, I'm very well. It's thank a you. long time, no see. Very long time, far too long. How much gin do you reckon you've consumed since last time I saw you to now? A lot. A lot. You like your gin, don't you? <laughs> the fear of you a like lot. your gin. Do you I have a favourite gin? What time of day is it? Okay. What, what, <laughs> what, what, how am I drinking it? Have I got out of bed in a good mood or a bad mood? Yeah. There's like there's, there's ten thousand plus gins. Jim with a cucumber or Jim with lime? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the gin. Oh yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Mm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get Sorry, I'm just thinking about cucumber. cucumber. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, we're here tonight to talk to you about Ginopolis, yes. which was formerly known as? Formerly known as World Gin Day Manchester. Right. So, we've had rebrands. Yes. I've had a rebrand. They've yes. had a rebrand. Um, so, we are now Ginopolis. So, taking Cognopolis and gin and smooshing them together. Very clever. I know. Very clever. We're good. <laughs> and what can we expect to see from this fabulous event? So, 11th of June is the most wonderful time of the year. Being, it's not Christmas. It is World Gin Day. <laughs> And that weekend, we are doing exactly as we did in pre-coronial times. Pre-coronial. <laughs> I like that. Oh, we're having that right that day. <laughs> that time, pre-coronial. In pre-coronial times, we are getting together to just drink a lot of gin. Right. So Isn't that you... what we did in coronial times? <laughs> well, we did, but we didn't really do it together. <laughs> we did it together through Zoom, and it just wasn't the same. No, it's fair. No. It was just, no, I miss people. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> This event, it takes you where to where? So it's all over the city. So currently we have, I think it's 12 bars that are signed up. So everywhere from the Edinburgh Castle to um, uh, Mechanica. That's a oh, yes. fabulous new bar. Um, all the way over to our favourites, Tariff and Dale. We love Tariff and Dale. We do it's love Tariff and Dale. I like the little wheel just as you go in. You know, the little cast iron wheel. Yeah. Got that. It's lovely. It's very nice. Uh, and it's, it sounds like it could be expensive, but it's not, is it? No, it's not. £7.50 gets you the virtual wristband. We've gone virtual. 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 So it's a QR code. Right. It gets you the QR code, and that gives you access to all the discounted gins, cocktails, all the bits and pieces that are going on. So there's two-for-ones. There are special cocktails that are being put on by bars. There's all sorts of stuff going on that they've got planned, and it just for the whole weekend, as many times as you like. Oh, it sounds dangerous. Yeah. It sounds like a good time. Because yeah. when I go to an all you can eat buffet, let me tell you, I'm not just going around once. <laughs> so with gin, you can imagine how it would turn out, don't you? A little sore-headed on the Monday. Yes, yeah. indeed, quite it's right. Day yes. off on the Monday. <laughs> that feeling yeah. where you try and lift your head off the pillow and it feels like concrete. Oh, no, that no, feeling. no. It's that feeling when you go to bed and the room spins. Yeah, you try yeah, and play a game of catching up with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned a QR code. You mentioned yes. Where can they find this QR code? So it's the Genopolis Manchester website, which right. we will put everywhere, so yeah. you, you won't be able to miss it, and I'm sure you'll be putting it out on your socials we as well, indeed. because we've partnered with you. We are oh. partnered. Partnered with you in Manchester. Manchester. We're 12th of June, uh, Ginopolis, and uh, look, there you are, let's see, it says visit ginopolis.co.uk to buy your £7.50 QR code, and that basically just lets you go on the Raz for the entire weekend. Pretty it? much, Which pretty is much. cracking into You will make that £2.50 back in booze in yeah, the whole oh, time. <laughs> so are there any events going on that people can expect from different bars and anything special that certain ones are doing? I am waiting for details. We're still getting mm. bits together, but I have some, seen some very exciting looking cocktails. We're kind of like inching it out on socials. Slowly, so tease, tease brings you in. <laughs> mm, doesn't it sound fabulous? It sounds threatening me with a good time. I know it sounds exciting. I'm, <laughs> it's literally I'm literally going to pick up the, my little phone in a minute when we uh, when we get to the credits, and I'm literally going to get the QR code, and I'll be like, like I'm on my way. And then everywhere I'm working at the weekend, I can just expect a very sort of squiffy Belinda for the weekend. I thought that was just regular. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's June, isn't it? It'll be June, so it'll be fine. It'll be good. It'll be crap. Pride month. It'll be good. Uh, so your involvement in this has developed and developed some more, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, we've been doing it for five years. 
which is actually quite scary. And the, the original idea was behind it was that I just got really annoyed with the fact that Manchester wasn't doing anything for World Gin Day. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of amazing gins mm -hmm. made in the city, literally yeah. in the city. We literally have we Manchester gin. Exactly. And we weren't doing anything. So um, got together with a couple of friends. We decided to do something ourselves. And it's grown from there. Um, as I say, we're now five years in and we're doing it all again. Quite right. Fantastic. It's the, it's the specific bars to gin as well, isn't it, these days? Yeah. Loads of them. So, I mean, obviously, we've got Atlas in the city that specialise. Yes. They have um, over 500 now, I think, that right. they have on their bar. Mm. I don't think they have room for anything else, quite frankly. No. I don't think there's any space for anything else in there. Um, Tariff and Dale do some fantastic gin serves. Even bars that specialise in other stuff do some fantastic G&T serves. I've had a few, the Brewdog ones have started doing their own one, their Lung Wolf stuff. Yep. Fantastic gin. Whiskey Jar. Do their own yes. whiskey twist on a G and T, which is fantastic. I mean, gin went away for a bit, didn't it? It wasn't popular for a while, mm. and then it came back with a vengeance. Does yeah. it? Yeah. Why? There's a whole history behind it. So, I'll, I'll go as quick as I can. But basically, in um, around about 2006, 2007, um, we didn't have much gin at all. Um, after there was a law passed many, many years ago when we had a bit of an issue with gin, we were, I mean, borderline alcoholics. Um, <laughs> Mm. I wish I was exaggerating. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of not. Um, there was a law passed that meant that when people were distilling, they had to pay a lot of money to distill. So only right. the big boys could do it, which is why we only had Beef Eater and Gordon's yes. and Bombay Sapphire. It was the big boys. Um, in about 2007, Sipsmith Gin went to HMRC and said, guys, we don't want to make big, huge amounts of gin. I mean, they do now, but yeah. you know, at yeah. the time, they didn't want to make big, huge amounts of gin. They wanted to follow in the footsteps of the craft beer movement and actually make gin more accessible and yeah. more interesting and make it in small capacity um and so they did a deal with hmrc and they based it it took them a couple of years sort of negotiating but it's opened the floodgates oh, yeah. so many different flavors now i mean obviously i remember when rhubarb and ginger became like a first thing oh, yeah that flew off the shelf <laughs> I mean, parma violet like yeah just blew people's minds and now you get different flavors from banana to pineapple to you still can't be a good tankery Oh, I love a tank. Oh, I do like tank 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 and tonic. Tank and tonic, yes. Tonic. Tonic Tank and tonic. Must be benefiting from it as well. Oh, hugely, hugely. I mean, Fever Tree leapt on it. Yeah. yeah. Big style, big style. But we've also seen an explosion of tonics that have come out and other mixers because a lot of the issues that people have with gin is they don't like tonic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's uh, kind of what I do is explain to people, you don't have to drink it. You don't like it with tonic. Don't There's drink no it with tonic. There's no rules, is there? There are genuinely no rules. As I mean, long as just you have nine of gin them and, juice. and feel a bit squiffy, that's, that's yeah, the right thing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's honestly ginger ale. Ginger ale and tonic, uh, ginger mm. ale and gin, absolutely mm. fantastic. A certain gin to go with ginger ale? Um, a peer would be really nice because okay. that's oh, got I a little bit beer. of spice going on yeah, in it, which works beer. really, really nicely. Ooh, sounds I'll a bit chilly in it. Sounds a bit Caribbean, that one, doesn't it, really? Yeah, it's, it's got a little bit. Yeah. It's the spice root, so yeah. it's sort of India. Ooh, we need to have it with like chilies and things like that. I'll just eat the chilies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, let's put that slide up everybody because we want everybody to get this QR code immediately, right now. You can even switch off this program if you want to and get this get QR it. code. It's only £7.50. <laughs> Visit ginopolis.co.uk. It's on the 10th to the 12th of June. This year, everybody, you've waited long enough for something like this. You may as well fully take full advantage of it, everybody. That's what I said. Yeah. QR code. Yeah. yeah. Simple, easy. Yeah, Straight to worry about it, land. Yeah. Response. All you need to worry about it is picking up a glass. Picking up a glass. Yeah. And deciding what gene you're having. Oh, I don't think it'll take much. Nah. It's point a colourful one. <laughs> at, the point, at the end, that's a nice bottle. Let's get that. It's a nice bottle. Up. Just pick it up and drink it, everybody. <laughs> and enjoy that weekend, turn to 12th of June. For now, though, Charlie, just the sacks. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then, everybody. We are unfortunately now out of time, but it has been an absolute pleasure speaking to all our lovely people today, everybody. Uh, thank you to our Jack Cameron Dickinson, to our lovely Charlie Houston Sykes, Henry Lewis, and the one and only Sophie Willen. Have you had a fun? I have. We've had a Jam pack show. It's, it's a jam pack show. I'm just checking the clock because I've left the um, washing on the line. Right. In the meantime, everybody, make sure you check out our podcast. Shut up. Make sure you check out our podcast 
And uh, once again, let's just have that little radio sting just before we go one more time, please, if you don't mind. Just to remind you, coming your way from the 20th of June. Coming soon. Chatterbox Radio. Part of the Your Manchester Media Family. Broadcasting live every day. It's where the city comes to talk. Indeed it is, everybody. In the meantime, ta cocker. See you later. High five. Thanks for watching this week's episode of... You're Manchester! <laughs>